there a moment when you realized that you wanted to be an artist? I mean, I've always been fascinated with visual media uh, and also with music. So, I mean, I think one of my first big like struggles as a young person was I was trying to figure out whether I was going to be a character designer for Disney or if I was going to write music uh, like uh, Tim Rice and was it, uh, Mencken, two, two of the big Dis Disney Renaissance musicians. And uh, yeah, I was really struggling with it, you know, which is funny to be seven, six, seven years old and that's your problem in life. And I remember having to go to my adoptive mom and just be like, oh, I don't know. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I have these problems. I'm like, I feel like a grown up, you know? And luckily my, my mom just said, well, just do both, you know? And becoming the type of artist that I am, I get to kind of do both where I am composing a lot of music for the video art and I'm doing character development and actually getting to do some animations. So, so many of the things that I was interested in as a young person, I remember there was kind of this phrase, uh, jack of all trades, master of none. Um, but for me, I found that being able to kind of rotate the same way I did as a child, becoming very fascinated and hyper-focused on something, instead of fighting that and denying who I am and what works best for me, I've been able to find a way to navigate through those different types of styles of making. Um, and I think that really comes from a childhood of being very fascinated with a lot of stuff. Uh, and Roger, Who Framed Roger Rabbit is my favorite film. And they did a lot of behind the scenes kind of mini documentaries for television. At least two came out when the film came out to promote it. And to be able to see the animators working on it, to see all the special effects, to learn about blue screen, I mean, and also the puppetry that went into uh, moving objects so then they could draw the characters in, all the tech that they built to make characters pick things up and then draw on top of. I mean, it, it just blew my mind as a young person because it let me see that there were people who got to grow up and continue to be fascinated with making and problem solving. And these were grown-ups that could drive cars and you know had a home. And so it, it made me see that I could be one of those creative people too. So, but it wasn't until I got much older, I didn't think that you could be an artist because uh, I thought you had to die, like starve and then die and then, then you get famous. And, uh, and it wasn't until I had roommates that were life models uh, for some of the universities in Massachusetts, uh, the Cambridge, Boston area. And I learned more about what they did because I was very confused by the whole thing. And I was like, well, who's drawing you? And they said, oh, these people, they go to school for this and they become artists. And I thought, well, but, but you can go to school for that? I had no idea. I had studied uh, music at Berklee College of Music and was composing my own music. And I don't know, I, it wasn't for me, but I didn't know what I was gonna do. And when I found out that the option of actually becoming an artist and that there were like art shows and exhibitions, it was a whole world that I just didn't think living people were a part of. Uh, and then to, to be kind of welcomed into that world was just so exciting. So yeah, it was a long journey getting to visual art, um, but I'm so glad to be here now. Yeah. yeah. Now, where I, does all the inspiration come from? I think often, the inspiration comes from work that celebrates the idea that we have feelings and that our feelings, when they, as Fred Rogers talked about, this idea of if they are mentionable, then they can be manageable. Uh, and, as, and, and instead of telling a child when they are upset, I'll give you something to really be upset about, you know, uh, not what they're feeling right now is actually really important. And if we're able to help them process that feeling through creativity, through movement, whatever it is, uh, they're gonna be able to have a better understanding of themselves, better trust of how they handle their emotions. And that pulls kind of a heartstring for me, I think. Uh, and I tried to celebrate that in my own work. The scene in Roger Rabbit that changed my life was, um, there was a very slow scene right after he found out the scandal with his wife. And, he just walks into an alleyway and he just cries. 
you hear him sobbing and he's looking at pictures and he's crying. And I had never seen a very cartoony character just crying in a way that wasn't supposed to be comical. And it just struck me somewhere inside where it felt like this person is supposed to not be allowed to be sad like this. And, and, and why is this moving me? And over the years, you know, you tuck that memory in and you don't think about it. And then you go to grad school and you're pulling every memory out, trying to get resources <laughs> to be like, why do I do what I do, you know? And so pulling that out and thinking, oh, it's because there is this liberation, this freedom, uh, when the rules of how we're supposed to be f feeling are broken. And with Fred Rogers, there was a scene actually where someone, one of the human characters, told one of the puppet children characters, oh, don't feel that way. And he cut, he, he had everyone stop working. And, you know, he's such a gentle guy. And that was one of the few times that he was very firm with everyone and said, don't tell a child how to feel and don't make them feel bad for feeling. You know, that kind of idea, I'm paraphrasing, but I remember starting to find these linkages, you know. Uh, Pee Wee's Playhouse is another huge influence and still to this day, I love when they all start screaming. That's my favorite part, that was my favorite part as a kid. And I think it's also because it's letting kids be kids. And I love the fact that they told us to scream. So even if, you know, my parents didn't want me to be noisy, I'd say, well, the, the adult on TV said that we're all supposed to scream and they're all grown ups and they're screaming and all the globy is being a globe and he's screaming and, you know, Terry's being a pterodactyl, he's screaming. And so it just felt so great to do the things that kids are supposed to do and to have an adult there that thought that that was great too. You know, in Korea they have these, uh, you know, arcades where people play video games and they'll also have little uh, mini norebang. Nore, nore means song, bang means room. Okay. So it's like a little singing room and you can go in and I saw this teenage girl, she just, she went in and she put her money in and she closed the door. She was in there for a while, I guess, singing. It's soundproof. And then she just came out and she looks so much more relieved, you know, okay. just to. That's what we need, yeah. Yeah, like little singing rooms where you can just, <laughs> yeah. you know, dance around a Guns N' Roses, like Sweet Child of Mine or something, you know? Like, I mean, I, yeah, I think it's really important. Uh, the, the other big influence is Marvel Comics. Uh, one of my best friends since preschool, we're still buddies. Uh, when I'll be working on installation projects, I'll send him photos of my progress. And uh, when I'm coming up with characters now, we used to trade Marvel comic book series three uh, cards. They had these like Marvel Universe cards. And so all of us would bring them to the lunch table and trade with each other because we're trying to get all the full set and the holograms or the holographic cards. And I mean, even now we'll talk about it with this level of nostalgia. And I think when it came to world building, that was so crucial because there was such a sense of order within the Marvel Universe. And even if the outside world felt like chaos sometimes, that world I could trust that there was a certain type of order and that the creative people who were working on it genuinely cared about it, whether it was the illustrators or the writers. And I think that that kind of structure, when I started working in grad school to really kind of organize my imaginary world, the cosmic womb, and to use it as the parameters of how I created structure within such an interdisciplinary style of working, I mean, what better world to work with? I mean, we, we're seeing even now how that mythos of Marvel and their structure is expanding to cinema yeah. and to a larger audience. And people love the fact that there's this history, that there's these characters, and they're not just gonna do one thing in one movie and then just, I don't know, be completely different in another. And if they are, the fans check them on it, you <laughs> right, know? Yeah, yeah. And I, and I feel like in my own mind, there's this young version of me that's eight years old, and if I have a character do something that they shouldn't do, you know, there's that eight-year-old version of me in third grade trading those cards <laughs> being like, Ju Young, you know that character wouldn't do that. And I'm like, all right, well then I guess we have to, but the painting needs purple in it here. Well, there shouldn't be any purple characters there. Well, what if we made a character like red and blue but checkered so it kind of looks like purple you know so there's these things that you're creating this dance between the formal responsibilities of being an artist and then also uh, this strange kind of storytelling structure and I think that the two put together uh, just ask for innovation. What was the inception of the cosmic womb? Uh, well the cosmic womb 
Um, I remember I was looking at a book uh, by Nancy Ferrier uh, called The Primal Wound and about how children who are adopted, uh, the birth mother and the child, the child has this wound from the moment that, that the mother decides to separate. Even in the womb, there's this primal wound. And, you know, my own adoption journey was a struggle many times. It's also been very joyful. Um, but I thought, if I'm going to have a wound, then I need a place that is of constant, unconditional love and healing. And I remember when I was studying in Korea, they had these scholarships for Korean adoptees, and I would go back to study language. And I was learning how to talk about, oh, it was a gender studies feminism course. And they said that the womb was called the Agi Chib, which Agi means baby and Chib means house. So it's the baby house. Yeah. I was like. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, like, women do more than just be baby houses, but that is an adorable way to say, like, that part of the body, the womb, is the Agi house. And I thought, well, maybe I need to make, like, a larger kind of universe version of this, like, Agi house, this, this kind of healing place for that child self. Um, and so I started to grab from the, I used to make books as a child. I was really bossy. So before I could even write, I would have my babysitter during the summer, um, Becky Porter, this very patient uh, girl from my parents' church would babysit me and I would have her write the words and then I would draw the pictures because I couldn't write yet. And luckily my family kept those books so I had a stack of all these books about all these characters and so that kind of started the foundation of getting some kind of story structure together. 1988 I wrote my first book that we were able to bind and actually type it on print it from a computer that like because we had one computer in the hallway at my school it was such a big deal and I, I made a book about Prince Amos the, or Amos the first mouse to go to the moon and he goes in a cave and luckily he survives this experience, which I thought was kind of interesting that it goes into like kind of theory in the cave, but I, I, I didn't know about any of that. But he has since then upgraded to Prince Amos of the Mice People and uh, he's now a puppet and you can see him dancing around in a lot of my videos. He's been in some paintings. And so taking these childhood characters and then also supplementing and creating kind of projects for myself uh, to expand the universe. So I was interested in creating a coming of age story. So I started studying all these other kind of films that are about coming of age. So like Labyrinth, and then ones that I don't particularly, they're not my favorite, like Frozen, I didn't really understand it. I still don't really get it. But by sitting there and taking notes, I was able to see what I felt was strong and what wasn't reaching me and what I thought could be different. And then by taking all of that, I created the story of Spaciatano. And, um, also known as Captain Spaciatano, and she's actually on the dinosaur that's going that okay, is in yeah. this exhibition, um, on top of perennial favorites. And this the the piece is like the finale of her kind of you know in Snow White when they ride off on the white stallion. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, I'm not really like a white horse kind of girl. Other people love them. I mean, I love horses, but. I was like, a dinosaur is more how we would do this in the cosmic womb. Yeah. And, and so the story itself, you know, kind of naturally invited all these characters, kind of like, you know, Frank L. Baum is another huge influence for me, the Wizard of Oz books. I have mild dyslexia, and, but I could, read, I could read Frank L. Baum's books because the characters were just so wonderful and so delightful. And uh, so I tried to, you know, take how these other people would solve problems, often he would bring in new characters, you know? And I noticed that's a pattern I probably got from him, as you go along your journey and you meet someone who helps you understand something about yourself, and they also grow and you work together and you, you carry on and create a group. And so by the time we meet them in this piece, uh, we see that she's freed her, uh, her boyfriend, now her husband, uh, Ann Plexus, okay. who has the yellow she's suit yellow on. Here. So she's the black and white. Mm -hmm. And they are both uh, black stars. Uh, when the Big Bang happened, you know, there's all these different types of cosmic energy that were released, and one of them were this, this whole race of sentient stars that are completely uh, black in color, or the color of heaven. So they look like the nighttime sky. And that's why we haven't been able to find them, is because they're camouflaged. Mm -hmm. uh, but many of them have been a part of our history. Uh, what was it when they first started noticing that the world, uh, that 
that it wasn't that everything else circled around the world. Um, an astronomer drew three black stars on a piece of paper because he noticed that these moons of Jupiter were rotating around it. And then he realized, oh, we're not the center of the universe. <laughs> and so those three black stars that he drew, I created them into characters that they finally revealed themselves because they realized that Earth was ready to know that they weren't the center of the universe. They were growing up. And so sometimes they look like stars, sometimes they look like humanoid beings. They can change their shape like Mr. Fantastic. Mm. Um, and so, you know, Spasia uh, frees all these snow people in one of my paintings. She saves Amplexus, the greatest consensual hugger in the universe, <laughs> which he was the greatest hugger in the universe. And then someone said, well, what if you don't want to hug? So I said, well, he's the greatest consensual hugger. And I thought, if she's space, what would be more perfect than an embrace and emplexus means to embrace in Latin. Um, and so the two characters kind of come together in that special way uh, and then they're riding off into the sunset. None of that would have happened unless I had created this zany imaginary world where then I have to supplement it by spending you know, months building these sculptures to make it real. Because it's one thing to have it in your mind or to write it on a piece of paper for your thesis or to write chapters in a book. But when you are actually building a dinosaur and then you and your neighbors have to hug the dinosaur to rotate it, that changes your whole feeling about it because you know what it feels like. I remember we were putting flowers on the top of the dinosaur and we ha I had to climb up on it. So I was literally riding a dinosaur and putting flowers on it. And I was like, this is amazing. Like, how did this happen, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, it just, it's, it feels so great that these kind of surreal experiences, uh, like that in everyday life, I never thought, you know, when I was working uh, retail or waitressing or doing all these different jobs that I'd ever get a chance to ride a giant, flowery, furry, fuzzy <laughs> dinosaur in my garage, uh, you know? But I think that's one of the powers of art. So the cosmic womb, I feel like everything I do, I mean, I'm even a character within it in many ways where they, every time that we see these characters coming out into this world, I'm actually the liaison, the earth uh, kind of uh, ambassador of sorts. And so I keep in direct co connection with the queen of my imaginary world, Queen Kiyok, who is in the painting that will be here. She wears a hanbok, and it's inspired by the hanbok that my birth father gave me when I first met him. And so, uh, you know, she'll consult with me and ask if I think this is a good space for them to visit, and we talk it over, and then I, I'm asked to come here by her order to make sure that everything goes smoothly. Um, and luckily, she's continuing to let me do this job. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's kind of fun how it becomes this kind of role-playing thing where I obviously, you know, this is a paracosm, which means it's a highly structured imaginary world that I, as the artist, know that it is not real, but I know that I feel genuinely responsible for it, even though it isn't real, because if I don't take care of it, it will start to uh, fall away unless I share enough of it where other people feel like they have enough investment into it to, to take care of it, you know? Yeah, they can live inside the world too. And so many people, I mean, the garden, uh, I would say maybe 50% of the garden here. This garden began because when the brontosaurus, you know, they decided it wasn't a real dinosaur, I was curious where do things go when we stop believing in them? where do all of us go? Where should we go when we feel like other people aren't believing in us? And so I thought, what if there was this brontosaurus that escaped becoming, like vanishing, almost like disappearing, uh, like a never ending story. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, but. you know, they're, the dinosaurs, the brontosaurus are trying to get away from uh, the nothing. The nothing, that is, yeah, what it is in the... Yeah, in the like that story. kind of energy, just kind of trying to erase them. And so they end up stumbling upon the cosmic womb in outer space, and they want their own planet. And so they had this dream of building a garden that would soon become a planet. And so when I have volunteer time, people can make a flower, and the flower is supposed to represent someone who helped them grow up brave and strong. And the dream is that someday 
the garden will get big enough that they can have their own planet. And so the garden's called the Garden of Courage and Love. And usually uh, when I do exhibitions, um, you know, pre-pandemic, we were able to have a time where people from the local community could come and make a flower that represented someone who made them feel like enough. So we've done this at the Art Museum of Southeast Texas. We've done this in Boston through Leslie University, and then also in my old studio in Houston. Um, and so when you pick up a flower, I, a lot of times I can tell you who it was that did it, or at least their story. So uh -huh. this is Patrick Partita. He's an artist, and he made three flowers to represent him, his wife, and his child because that's what makes him feel brave and strong. You know, there's a couple uh, that was an artist and an architect, and I love that the, the, um, the girl was much shorter than the guy, but her flower was much taller, <laughs> and I, they're my friends. And so being able to see these pieces, um, every time that they get reinstalled, I remember where those people were in their life at that time, and uh, it reminds me, too, of all the people who have helped me continue my journey of learning what it means to be brave and strong because I think that that's something that we never stop it's not like you you figure it out and then you're like okay now I'm brave and strong <laughs> yeah. I got it Check. it's it's the collective strength of all of these people that come together throughout your life that helps you continue to be a good navigator of all of the struggles that you go through and also just accepting the joyous and the good things too you know yeah. so yeah it's a little bit about the cosmic womb. That's beautiful. I can't wait till it's here and set up so I can explore through it. <laughs> um, I think we're here now. Okay, so something else I saw is that you like in your art to kind of, I guess, question the new thought theory. Oh, Things yes. That do. Yeah, yeah. The law of attraction. Kind of oh, thing. yeah, all that yeah. stuff. Can yeah. You explain, tell me, like, what. What is it that you don't register with the law of attraction? Um, I don't like, I'm not particularly a big fan of things that make you think that if you process your feelings that bad things will happen to you. I think that it's okay to have feelings that are hard. I think it's important to be monitoring your feelings in a way where you see them as either sometimes feelings aren't true and they aren't helpful and they're actually hurtful but we need to examine those things at least in my opinion so then we can get to the root of whether a feeling is something that is genuinely felt by ourselves or is something that has been taught to us but if we are fearful of our feelings and think that some kind of superstition that if we think this feeling something bad's going to happen to us i don't think that that is a healthy way to live and I feel that a lot of their ideas about uh, uh, manifesting some reality because you manipulated the universe to give you something, no, I, uh, everything we do is connected to everybody else. And so it is this long process of being involved with other people and sharing and giving and taking and you know or receiving you know it's a lot more complicated than i'm just going to sit here and think about a cup of coffee and then if someone gives it to me i'm going to say oh i manifested it no someone else spent the time being thoughtful enough to think about bringing you a cup of coffee you know um and there's somebody else who you know picked the beans grinded it decided to leave their children at home so they could come here to you know prepare it I mean, there are, there's so much more, and to simplify it in that way, I don't think is healthy. And the idea that somehow if you get all these things that you desire, then you will feel complete. This whole kind of self-improvement thing, I have a lot of, I think certain things can work and are helpful, but it's not the whole truth. Um, and that the idea that somehow if we attain these things, we'll feel better about ourselves, no, the, like self-improvement, who you are deep down inside, there is like, it's like Mary Poppins, um, the purse that she had. Oh, yeah. It looks like there's just a few things in it, but as they go on the journey, she's pulling more stuff out. I think it's the same way in our lives where we're just 
if you stay on the path, if you learn to love the person you are today, you're in a much better place to be able to grow and to uncover all those gifts that are already inside of you. It's just that each of those things needed to be unlocked from the journey that you go on. The same way a seed has all the potential to become a tree, uh, it just has to go on the journey of a seed for all that to be unlocked. It's not about like, you're not, a, I, like, if I was a seed and I thought, oh, I'm not enough, like, I'm not enough unless I get this rain, unless I get this water, unless I get this air, the sunlight, like, I'm dependent on all these things to be grand. It's like, no, all that is grand is already inside of you. Kind of like the uncarved block idea in Chinese philosophy. Yeah. It's all there and exactly. all this potential is there. And so, uh, yeah, because I, I think that there's nothing worse than for someone to spend their whole life wishing that they were somebody that they aren't, or like that they currently aren't, to have that desiring suffering instead of, um, what was that? I was talking to my husband about drawing, and I love the Stan Lee How to Draw Marvel Comics, yeah. and I would try to follow every way that they did it, and, and my husband, he also draws, and didn't really, he said, I don't know about those books. I didn't trust them as a kid. I thought I was cheating using those books. And I said, but didn't you want to, you know, improve your skills as, uh, as a draftsperson? And, and he said, you know, the Spider-Man I draw today is the Spider-Man that I'm supposed to draw. And tomorrow's Spider-Man will be different. But I can't draw tomorrow's Spider-Man unless I draw today's Spider-Man. And so when I work with students, I tell them the same thing. You know, when you draw and create what you do today, you don't need to send a bunch of hate towards it or, oh, I wish this was something else. Just know that you have to make this today so then you can make whatever you're gonna make tomorrow. And that's, that's the way it goes with art, you know? Yeah. And, and the more that we're able to be loving and accepting of who we are right now, I mean, it just makes it, as Fred Rogers would say, you know, when we have this healthy, positive self-love, we get along and get on in the world so much more easily, you know, because uh, we all know somebody who doesn't like themselves, they don't like their clothes, they don't like their car, they don't like this, they don't like the weather, they didn't like the weather yesterday, they're still mad about the weather from six months ago, and it's, it's like, geez, like, yeah, I should die. yeah, yeah, the, how, how is that ever going to be like a place where where you can uncover anything if you've put all this stuff on top, you know? And so that's where I think my uh, skepticism about this whole self-improvement thing is. I think that it's a lot har harder and harder to market the idea that everything is actually already inside you. Right. It's just that you gotta go on this journey, you gotta, you gotta fail sometimes, sometimes things work out, you know, and you gotta learn and grow, because cause you can't, put that in a book or a bottle. You can't sell it. Everyone's journey is different. Yeah, and I mean, my uh, last video art project, the Infinite Pie Project, was all about that, about creating these alternative to the self-improvement kind of uh, self-improvement coaches. They're you are enough coaches. And they're these little pies that tell you that you don't have to fight for your slice of the pie. We all have our own pie, we all have our own path, we have our own journey, we have our own life to live. And I really do believe in this era where everyone, there's a lot of people kind of hooked into social media where I've always thought social media was kind of like, you know, on Valentine's Day when people get to leave something nice for you, you know? I was like, oh, this is fun. This is like, I get to see what they're doing. And then I can write them a little note like on Valentine's Day when you give them like a little card. But then I didn't realize until I started having some of the volunteers that were working with me would say, oh, I look at Instagram and I just get so depressed. Like, what am I doing with my life? Like, all these people are doing amazing things. And I would think, you're doing amazing things too. I am so amazed by all the things that you're teaching me. Yeah. And so that was the inspiration for trying to create a character that celebrates the idea of you are enough and no one else can live your life but you. Only you can have that pie, you know? Yeah. And so... Um, I'm always trying to find ways to share new ideas and, and kind of philosophies about life that I've been gifted from these experiences of working with people through some kind of audiovisual form. I mean, because it was so effective for, say, Jim Henson, another huge influence on me, 
um, you know, what we saw happen with Sesame Street or Fred Rogers or many of the Disney films. You know, there are moments that uh, celebrate imagination, celebrate using your feelings uh, to help you grow, to acknowledge them. Um, I mean, I don't know if there's anything that I thought was at the core of everything I do. There's uh, the national motto of the cosmic womb or the planetary national motto of the cosmic womb <laughs> is have faith for you have always been loved. And I hope that the work continues to promote that idea that even if you didn't grow up in a family where you felt unconditionally loved or maybe you felt abandoned or you didn't feel like you were ever enough, somewhere out there in this universe, whatever you want to call it, there is an enduring energy that has always wanted you to be alive, to be who you are today. Whether it's the science of the cells in your body that wants you to heal every time that you, you know, bruise your knee. Um, or it's a math teacher that stays after class that reminds you that you're not stupid, you just think about numbers differently. Yeah. There's somebody out there that has loved you just as you are, you know? For sure. Yeah. Nice. Okay, so through all of this, you did mention that your mother told you to just be all the things that you wanted to be. But what is, the, what is some advice that has really stuck with you throughout your journey? Hmm. Mm, that's a good one. <laughs> I think, I think that the thing throughout this journey of being an artist has, the thing that I've really learned a lot about is, is being a good navigator. I used to think that if you set your heart on something, then you have to do it 120% or something. And if you change your course, then you've failed. And what I've learned over time is that no, it's, it's really not about that, at least for me, how I define success, and everyone defines it differently. But for me, it's really been about learning about being more like bamboo, being more flexible, you know, or being like a good captain of a ship. And you don't know whether tomorrow there's going to be a giant storm or you're going to have, you know, clear skies. What matters is that you know how to steer your ship and that you are going to do what is best for your crew. And... So that has meant, you know, with the pandemic that I had to change how I was doing things. I was going to do a film with human beings. Uh, then the pandemic happened, so I had to switch to puppets. And so that kind of created this whole situation where I had care. I wanted to have a spectrum of gender identities and kind of explore the intersection between race and gender. Um, and so I had a lot of very diverse cast members. But because I didn't have humans acting as the cast members that shared those identities, I went on the journey of finding voice actors that shared a sim I mean, they're not from outer space, like the <laughs> characters, but, you know, they, they may be, say, a, a gender fluid or gender queer intersex uh, artist that had a acting abilities, and I asked them to play a character who shared the same gender identity as them. They're not blue either. The character's blue. So, <laughs> you know, uh, but I, you know, I didn't think, I, I think in the past I used to think, oh, you failed if it, it couldn't be my original idea. But realizing that, no, this flexibility of being able to be mindful, thoughtful of your situation, and also a huge thing is self-care. You know, some of my earlier projects, I would just work and work and work, and I still am not the best about it, but work, you know, three days straight, not stopping, just drinking coffee and working, and, um, you know, the sun would go up, the sun would go down. I do time lapses, so parts of the garden are on video from when I first started building the garden, and it's a very labor-intensive process where you're, you're cutting the grass out of fleece uh, with a special automated uh, kind of it kind of looks like a pizza cutter okay. with like a motor in it. it sounds terrifying, but you're, <laughs> yeah. you're cutting it and then you have to staple each piece into a painted piece of uh, two by four that has a drilled hole in it so you can put the flower in. And I have made so many of those, you know, and so someone had noticed that the sun in the background of the time lapse had actually gone down and then gone up and then gone down. And 
So as I've continued on my journey, just being mindful of the fact that I also want to spend time with my family. I want to have a healthy body so I can keep doing this, which means sleeping more, eating better, spending time with friends, connecting with family, and having all those motivations that are going to inspire you to create work and stay healthy enough that you're in the kind of mindset because, I mean, if I paint something and I'm grumpy, it's probably going to look grumpy. So, I mean, I've definitely painted characters that are supposed to look happy. And I'm like, why is her brow so furrowed, you know? And it's like, I think it's time to put the paintbrush down and take a nap, you know, go to sleep. So, and, and knowing that, you know, if you're going to promote this kind of self-love, uh, what are you what are you doing? Like, are you doing that for yourself, too? You know, so um, mindfulness and knowing that, you know, it's great to have a destination. I mean, a lot of times I meet artists that they just they just want to be an artist. And I'm like, well, what does that mean to you? Yeah. You know, so kind of like if someone says, I want to go on vacation. You say, well, what, what where? <laughs> like, <laughs> we could go to Disney World or we could go to, like, Nebraska. Like, you got to <laughs> tell me where you want to go. Uh, so we have an idea of, you know, so if you end up at, you know, Universal Studios because you realize you want to go see the Harry Potter thing, um, I mean, yeah, but at least you had an idea of where you wanted to go. Yeah. And then I think that there's such great strength in knowing when you're like, wait, we need to change course because I got to go over here and see this. I got to experience this. And to know that when your heart pulls you towards something, that's okay too. Your heart is a great compass as well. Flexibility on travel is very important. Yeah, <laughs> whether it's travel in the mind or travel, yeah. you know, like I think there's a lot of things that my younger self didn't get to see um, that, that it, you know, it's it, interesting when something creates a hunger and you have two choices as to how you navigate that. You can say this is a defining point where other people decided for me that the world was not made for me, you know, and I'm going to go over here and feel horrible about it. Um, or there's that other path you can take, which is there is an open field here where there's so much stuff that hasn't been made. And if I make it, what will that do to me? You know, how will that change me and how could that possibly help change other people?